Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Detailed Diatribes, where today we're going to be spending some time talking about the world design in, in a little video game called Breath of the Wild. Yeah. Uh, and I'm joined by Red, uh, who will help me uh, explore the, the wonderful and very terrifyingly old world of Hyrule. Howdy everybody, I'm very excited to talk about Legend of Zegin today. Let's have a good time. The Lego of Zego. Lego so of Zego. I have, have played Breath of the Wild through twice. We've streamed it. Um, Red, you have other experience with the Zelda franchise besides just um, our Breath of the Wild streams. Yes, Twilight uh, Princess, my one true love. Uh, Twilight Princess. Yes. <laughs> um, and I'm tangentially aware of, you know, most of the stuff about it. Pop culture osmosis has done me proud in the Legend of Zelda yeah. space. You know, everybody knows about Link and then Zorda and all them jazz. And, and yeah, so, you know. <laughs> I, I'm pretty Rankin much an expert. Zarbo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Welda and Zelda. So today we will we will be engaging in a little bit of world design analysis to see that uh, the version of Hyrule as we have it in Breath of the Wild is old as fuck. Yeehaw. <laughs> uh, so we will be conducting a rigorous academic analysis uh, thereof. First things first, I would like to give a huge thanks to the YouTube channel Zeltic. Uh, he is a Legend of Zelda YouTuber who does all kinds of videos on theories, lore, analysis of uh, Breath of the Wild and all the other Zelda games. And his uh, Zelda theory videos were an inspiration in, in my process of putting this video together. And also a lot of the visuals that you'll be seeing, all the fancy B-roll, that's all his, so if you like what we're talking about here and you want to learn more, uh, there is a huge community of, of Zelda theorists out on the interwebs, but we've got some recommendations for, for where you can start with Zeltic if you want to follow on some of the stuff we're going to be specifically talking about in this one. So thank you, Zeltic, uh, for being great and for giving us your permission to uh, to use your theories and your footage. And let's let's talk about this game. Let's just jump into it. Yeah. The timeline of Zelda is very complicated, but what you need to know for the purposes of this video is that there are three things. At the very beginning is The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. Mm. And then there's literally every other game. <laughs> and then at the very end of the timeline is Breath of the Wild. Yep. Everything in the middle is just a mush that you can rearrange and it doesn't really make a difference. But the very beginning is Skyward Sword. The very end is Breath of the Wild. That's all you need to know. We can refer you to the Brian David Gilbert Legend of Zelda Unraveling Timeline Unraveled video from back in the old days uh, of like yeah, two plus years ago. Absolute classic. Absolute classic. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't recommend using it as a rigorous academic reference, but you know, it. Yeah. It, yeah. Uh, the gist, as you've correctly stated, is Skyward Sword is the very first Legend of Zelda game. It is the one that originates the characters of Link and Zelda as they are going to iterate throughout history. It. It creates Ganon as a, like a, an instance of this god of evil or something, Demise. The Demon King Demise, yeah. Yeah, that guy who you fight in a featureless mirrored plane because everybody loves doing that. And uh, <laughs> sassing of Skyward Sword aside, th then there's a whole bunch of other stuff in a nebulous and unclear order that branches at least three times. And then at the end is Breath of the Wild. Every game ends up in Breath of the Wild somehow. Because of the time break. Yeah. Like, everything before Breath of the Wild is the era of myth. It's all yep. like, yeah, we have legends of this stuff, but like, eh? So, <laughs> the legend um, of the legend of Zelda. Um, <laughs> the legend of the legend thereof. Because Breath of the Wild has a 10,000 year gap wherein all the other shit happens. But yes, yes. Yes. So Breath of the Wild, uh, the map is very big. Uh, it is full of references to older Zelda games. These are not necessarily the same actual locations, but they are cutesy references. So for instance, if you've done the Eventide Island side quest off in the bottom southeast corner of, um, of the map, this is an homage to Link's Awakening, uh, a game wherein Link wakes up on a mysterious island called Koholint uh, and has to wake uh, the, the great whale deity, the Windfish, to, to escape. Uh, the entire island is a dream, it's not real, mm. but here is an island in Breath of the Wild Hyrule that's basically Koholint. It's got Taranbo Beach, which is the name of the beach in Koholint, and huh. there's Koholit Rock, which is a slight corruption of the name, and that's the thing that they do a lot, is that they'll have Aww. names of things that are references to other to other things, but like a letter is changed, a syllable is different. It's it's a very, you know, simple uh, trick. So, you know, we've got Koholint, but it's it's not really the same Koholint, it's just a reference. Similarly, uh, Mekar Island uh, west of the Great Korok Forest is a reference to the first dungeon from the original Legend of Zelda game. It's not strictly the same location. It depends on, on how much you want to buy into it, but it is a very cute reference where there is one burnt out tree surrounded oh. by four smaller trees on an island that is uh, 
just you know, it, it's a cute reference. There, yeah. There's nothing really more to it than just than just the stylistic continuity and, and the visual echo. Uh, but it is cool that it exists. Uh, Makar Island is actually named after Makar, who is a character from Wind Waker, oh, yeah. uh, a a little a little Korok fellow. So this oh, island is actually right next to the Great Korok Forest. So there, there's just, it's references. It's it's not like you know strict like this was a thing that was here. It's just it's it's references. Yeah. So so these would be like kind of non diegetic callbacks where it's like yes. in universe there's no reason for this to be the same but it is anyway yeah. so it's it's like it's it's like poetry it rhymes it's yeah. yeah yeah basically no one within the the world of breath of the wild would recognize these as references to the other games um it, it's only something that a player can really process oh my god um, why so, has yeah. nobody made a meme of like Link starting one of them flashbacks and then just snapping back to one of the older games <laughs> <laughs> does the slow zoom on his eyes and then it's like da, 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 da. <laughs> he looks at the temple of time accidentally goes feral and turns into a wolf again <laughs> oh dang it so there are, there are a million of those those two are pretty illustrative but as we we move forward there's a lot of lore within breath of the wild that is unique to breath of the wild that conveys how insanely old this game is and this is not a comprehensive list otherwise we'd be here for for literal months yeah, but yeah. immediately like the the smallest scale of time that we really work with in this game is link right now the time that the player is playing as versus a hundred years before when the great calamity happened so there's an immediate hundred year time jump between you know Link and Zelda running around as, as kiddos, having a great time, preparing for the Great Calamity. Great Calamity happens. Mm -hmm. Link is asleep for 100 years, events of the game. So <laughs> there are sleep, a lot of things unquote. from the pre-Calamity time just 100 years ago that are, you know, in ruins now, but in cutscenes and stuff and flashbacks, you'll see it before. Uh, they're, basically, the whole game is like this. There, mm. There's stuff that was, you know, it was not ruins before the Calamity, and now it is. It's like the most modern of modern things um, you can imagine in, in terms of, of Zelda time. But going slightly further, um, down in the southwestern corner of the map, there are gigantic statues in the desert that that nobody understands oh, uh, and one it. of them is missing <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, in the gerudo desert there are seven statues of legendary heroines but the eighth one of them is not with the other seven the eighth heroine is over the gerudo highlands on the opposite side of a ginormous mountain range but her sword is not with the statue. The sword is buried in the rocks at the top of the mountain. <laughs> so the questions are, why bother to move the statue when you could have presumably just destroyed it for a lot less effort? Uh, and then also, how? <laughs> Question mark? <laughs> wow. <laughs> so. Not to flex my expertise, but I will say that the last time something really big had to get moved, we used Twilight Realm portals. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a whole yeah. ass bridge, so you know. <laughs> kind of a whole deal, yeah. Quite possibly. I mean, the, the, the <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are legends within the the Gerudo um, desert. Uh, people talking about these these statues that that have their own sort of mystique to them. So it's it's a known quantity to the the people of the Gerudo desert. Uh, you, Link is tasked to go find it because it's right. like, yeah, we we think there's this eighth statue out somewhere in the highlands, but no one's actually seen it. And of, and of course, you can find it. Of course, because um, no one is as insane a climber uh, as Link. <laughs> Uh, or insane enough to be a climber like Link, but it's just it's it's a cool thing. It's like yeah, there's a statue in the mountains. The sword is missing. It's stuck in the top of the mountain somewhere. When did this happen? Old enough that no one knows how or exactly when, but recent enough that people still remember it. So that's just that's just cool. I'm not saying the it's statue cool. came alive and stabbed that mountain, but I'm not not saying it didn't do that. <laughs> Statue's curse. Get it out. Can we break it? Nope. Nope. Get it out. Move it. <laughs> Scooch it. Lure it away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, further, uh, we we can jump back to 10,000 years before the events of Breath of the Wild because the Great Calamity that we experience from the 100 years ago time skip is actually the second Great Calamity. Mm -hmm. The first one was 10,000 years beforehand, and this is the legend that uh, that Impa uh, will tell Link about as he is starting to, to slowly piece together his, his poor amnesiac memories. Yeah. And it, it you know... 10,000 years is a long time, but this is still after all of the other Zelda games. So there's all of this lore where the, the Sheikah, the ancient Sheikah, created the Guardians, uh, those little, little spidery boys, uh, and the Divine Beasts to fight the Great Calamity Ganon. After the victory, Hylians are like, wow, cool, we beat Ganon. 
now there are these giant death machines. They're scary. Get rid of them. Mm -hmm. So after the first calamity, they bury all of the divine beasts. They bury all the guardians. And then when we get to the second calamity, 10,000 years later, King Rome is like, oh, shit. Uh, uh -huh. and Zelda's like, hey, dad, can we please excavate uh, the divine beasts? Otherwise, I think we're going to be really screwed. No, goddess magic. Get back to your training. <laughs> <laughs> so then they go through all the effort to excavate all that stuff. Uh -huh. So the, the guardians are, are ancient, ancient tech. Still comes after all the other games, so uh, lots of lots of weird old stuff. Might be some some Breath of the Wild two stuff in here, but I'm not gonna say too much to, to date this video. Uh, we'll see. Next uh, is a really cool detail oh. in Hebra Peak, uh, a mountain range in the the very far northwest of the map that has a perfect circle carved into it somehow mm. it's not uh it's not anything man-made uh, and it doesn't look like it would be a meteor um popular theories are that the work of tearing a perfectly cylindrical hole through the side of a mountain that creates a sort of glassy almost obsidian texture ho, on ho, it ho. from possibly having melted the rock is likely a result of an energy beam from the divine beasts so at the end of breath of the wild if you've completed all four divine beast quests they they train their lasers on hyrule castle and they blow some some mondo ginormous blue and white and black energy beams of the castle mm. and it seems likely given what we know about divine beasts and how insanely powerful they are that the wound through the center of Hebra Peak was a scar from the first battle against the Great Calamity. Oh, I love where that. Where a beam seems to have missed and just <laughs> torn a hole right the f*** through Hebra Peak. <laughs> Maybe that's why they buried the Divine Beasts. That I, is quite possibly why they buried them. You know, I, I gotta say, I, I've i always gotten some serious Ghibli vibes from Breath of the Wild, and it's quite intentional. Like, I mean, the art style, the visuals, you know, the, the character designs even, it all very much kind of resembles a lot of the classic Studio Ghibli movies. And I think the theming of there was an ancient war with incredibly powerful weapons and now we're trying to kind of move on and be all pastoral and cool, <laughs> but you know, there's big craters that you can see from orbit and shit like that. Um, yeah. There's a lot of that vibe. And I, uh, this is the first of these where I was like, oh, okay. So like the Naushika parallels, the, the castle in the sky parallels. <laughs> <laughs> They're just there. All right. Oh, sick. Yeah. I knew I liked Absolutely. this game for a reason. Hell yeah. yeah. So the divine beasts are, are conveyed to be powerful within the lore of the game. And being able to, to carve an entire empty cylinder through a mountain with an errant blast is pretty yikes. <laughs> And the fact that, like, that's not even noteworthy enough that it's, like, survived as legends or whatever. Like, nobody in the area is like, oh, yeah, that's when Varuda shot a laser at us. You know, it's not noteworthy yeah. because this world has so much happening in it. And I feel like sometimes when you're world building, it's tempting to fill the world with information. But it can be more telling what the world has forgotten. You know, what, what wasn't actually noteworthy or what wasn't able to survive yeah. as long as it did. Like, that can really make the world feel bigger and more mysterious because... If you can forget that a laser carved through your mountain, like, how much other <laughs> stuff do you deal with on an average weekend, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Hyrule has been through a lot, yeah. uh, as we will continue to see. And it's always um, full of blonde children for some reason. <laughs> always yeah, at the center exactly. of it. Exactly. Uh, and, and the Sheikah knew that there would always be blonde children at the center of it. So <laughs> after they, they buried the Divine Beasts and the Guardians, the Sheikah thought ahead and realizing that they always have to make this poor kid prove himself, they made 120 shrines uh, and hid them throughout Hyrule. Or not hid, but, but placed them throughout Hyrule. Right. Such that when the Great Calamity would return, they would be there to kind of uh, train the hero, but mostly test the hero mm. <laughs> uh, to make sure that he was good enough to really be the hero. Uh, sometimes yeah. putting the hero in more danger than some of the, the minions of the Calamity. Hey, if you get a dud link, then you'll get a new one in a generation or two anyway. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, so uh, the shrines are some some first Calamity tech. Mm. Uh, lots of stuff from the from the golden age of the, the technologically advanced ancient Sheikah. But aside from the Sheikah, there's another civilization called the Zonai, who are a very old, long-dead civilization from thousands of years before Breath of the Wild, but they're not so old that they've shown up in any of the other games. Uh. Uh, they're spread all over Hyrule. They're a very clear, like, Aztec, Maya, parallel, right. insert uh, civilization. Nobody in the game itself, nor in the IRL Zelda community, understands a goddamn thing about them. <laughs> There's maybe a Ganondorf connection, but it's very unclear. <laughs> well, all we know is that it is old. <laughs> <laughs> Gorgeous. All right. So what's yeah. the what's the general vibe with these boys? 
There, so there are a lot of ruins spread across the map. Uh, the picture that uh, I, I have here on, on the left of our little slideshow right. is from the Faron region, um, a very kind of jungly, like very like strong Maya vibes part of the map, where there's a lot of um, decrepit buildings, um, columns knocked over, statues of it's statues of owls, statues of boars, and statues of dragons, which is possibly a Triforce connection Ooh. with wisdom, courage, and power. Uh, yeah. Um, Ganon and, is typically also... a pig, so the boar thing does yeah, kind of fit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. There's, there, there, there's some stuff there, yeah, yeah. yeah. And owls, there are owls in the old games too, and they're usually like helping you out, like with advice yeah. and shit. So yeah, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we've got wisdom power, and I guess that means Link gets to be the dragon. Fuck sweet. The dragons are dragons are a staple uh, in the Zelda games. Uh, they they've appeared in, in many different forms. Yeah, that's um, fair. That's fair. But there are three of them that show up in Breath of the Wild. There is the the dragon mm-hmm. Farosh, uh, the dragon Dinrael, and the dragon um, Nadra, uh, who are elemental uh, of the three different components of the Triforce. Right. One of them's green, one of them's blue, one of them's red. Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes. What more do you need? <laughs> Classic. Uh, uh, and they just kind of exist. So um, so the dragon Farosh spends a lot of time in the, the Faron region. Uh, names are, of course, similar. Yep. Uh, hanging out by the by the Zonai ruins. Um, there are also, in much better shape, three labyrinths spread across Hyrule oh. that just exist in the far distant corners. There's one down by uh, Gerudo, there's one in the Hebrew region, and there's one uh, up northwest uh, off the coast of, of Akala. Um, just gigantic ass, like, minotaur type Hell labyrinths yeah. that are built with these styles of architecture that have a lot of these same design motifs with these these uh, owl faces, pig faces, dragon faces, uh, these swirly designs, all the same kind of patterning and, and architectural texturing um, to make it clear that this is some Zonai stuff. So there's like some maybe weird connection of the Zonai and the Sheikah having worked together because there are Sheikah shrines in these Zonai labyrinths. Ooh. It's weird. And no one understands it, and that's one of the coolest things is that they they created a a pure mystery to put in the game. So like the first calamity, like all that's like pretty solidly like we know enough to understand what's going on with the lore and the guardians and stuff. But the Zonai are just a complete wild card, and that's really cool. <laughs> it makes the ten thousand year old stuff that we know about still feel old because it's juxtaposed with this 10,000 year old stuff that we don't have a clue about. Yeah, and it makes the world feel bigger because this gives us something grounded in the world building that has basically nothing to do with our heroes and the main arc of the story. Like, they might have a connection with it, but if so, they're not like, you know, there's none none of the Sheikah people we talk to know anything about them or mention them at all, you know? It's like, they've got this whole civilization that clearly rose and fell and did its own thing and has barely anything to do with what we know about the main plot. Like, even if it does end up getting connected to it, it's like, it still feels huge and unrelated. And that's good. That makes the world feel bigger than just the main plot. And that's really important for world building like this. It's it's really well done. There's also one place I forgot to mention. There is uh, (laughs) an area called the Typhlo Ruins uh, in the north, uh, just uh, north of the the great uh, Korok Forest. That is a, an area of Zonai ruins that is shrouded in a magical darkness that cannot be broken. What? Um, so all you can do is take like a torch in there. You cannot see anything. You have to light all the little torches yourself to find your way. It is ruins shrouded in an impassable, unbreakable, magical cloud of darkness. Oh, some kind of How? twilight realm, what? you could say? Question <laughs> mark? <laughs> Confused Lovecraft noises? <laughs> ah? <laughs> Oh, yeah. man. Um, mysterious colors, unlike anything ever seen, except the mysterious color is black because it's it's ancient shadow. Yeah, no, unlike um, anything seen because you can't yeah. see it. Ooh. Imagine a place that is so old, the sun has not seen it in 10,000 years. Yeah. Horrifying. Let's move on. Sun uh, is like, oh, fuck <laughs> that. No. Yeah. Uh, on the more um, uh, biological side of things, uh, not just architecture all day long from, from good old blue, uh, there are also, uh, uh, we should not forget the three giant leviathans uh, whose skeletons are spread <laughs> throughout the region. Um, across Hyrule in the Gerudo Desert, in the Heber Mountains, and in the Elden, uh, Elden Mountains lie the skeletons of three gigantic leviathan creatures. There are some, some Sheikah shrines inside them for scale. 
They are terrifyingly large. Um, two of them are recognizable from older games, uh, namely Levias from Skyward Sword, who's in the Elden region, mm. uh, and the Windfish from Link's Awakening, Aww. which is in the Gerudo Desert. Um, but the third is a complete mystery. Uh, even concept art that shows a little more clearly, it's it's not recognizable to any of the cetaceous deities that we've seen in Zelda huh. before. Uh, it is a, a pure mystery, theorized to be for the sake of the player being able to put themselves in the utter confusion of what the rest of, of the world is like. It, it's, it's cool that they do it in such a way that they give you two you know, anchor points, and one where you are just as clueless as the rest of the people in the game. It's a really efficient way to go about creating that feeling of, what? So, it's unclear how long they've been dead. Clearly a very long time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the kind of thing that it, it could have been in that last 10,000 years, or they could have died, like, way in the middle of the timeline. Like, the wind fish, like, bit it in the middle of, uh, like, you know, uh, Twilight Princess or something. <laughs> <laughs> the Leviathans are cool. Yeah. First time I came upon one, uh, freaked me out because I, I did not know what I was looking at. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's. I think that's kind of the, the idea, you know? You run into yeah. a giant skeleton. Part of you is just like, oh, I don't like thinking about this. Yeah, and there are a lot of skeletons, like, you know, giant rib cages or skulls uh, mm -hmm. scattered throughout the map. But these are, as far as I'm aware, the only ones that are complete and identifiable, which makes it weirder somehow yeah, yeah fully articulated <laughs> skeletons are rare but you know we're not gonna yeah. we're not gonna paleontology splay in this video game yeah. you know <laughs> exactly um and then when we consider additional zelda lore uh breath of the wilds hyrule is eldritch as hell yes it is kind of insane when we get past the like yeah the the ten thousand years ago to the first calamity that's like baby mode uh compared to what some of the things we're about to look at now mm -hmm. It's it's pretty insane. So first off, some some easy one two parallels. Uh, the Arbiter's Grounds from Twilight Princess, where Ganondorf was uh, 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 attempted execution and it did not work. Uh, uh, yeah. Those are ruins in the Gerudo Desert. They're barely poking up above the sands, um, but it's implied they've been buried ages and ages and ages ago. Uh, the game barely acknowledges them. But they're there. Well, time you to can start tell excavating. It's the same kind of architecture. Yeah. You, it says on the map Arbiter's Grounds. Oh wow! Um, wow. They're not even... Yeah. Wow. I love it. Yeah. No, no, no. No. They, they... <laughs> Shigeru Miyamoto did not come to play. No, of course not. <laughs> why would leave? Why would you yeah. leave people guessing when you can give them an aha moment instead? Yeah. So there's <laughs> some things that are like pretty obviously clear that they that they go like, yeah, here you go. Um, there's also, of course, very obviously, uh, the Ocarina of Time gang is all here. The Temple of Time shows up right as soon as you walk out of the Shrine of Resurrection. It's right there. It's clearly busted up. But it's the Temple of Time. Um, there's also Castletown, which if you do some some cartography, Castletown actually kind of does map onto the Great Plateau, which is pretty Ooh. neat and a rarity among the, the parallels we're going to see here. There is also Longline Ranch, uh, which is the, the ranch where you get Epona from, from Ocarina of Time. Uh, that is burnt to shit, uh, but it does exist uh, in this game world, uh, which is very cool. There's also, uh, you can literally purchase Lon Lon milk from Hateno Village. Ha. Whether or not it's the same product, uh, the Lon Lon brand clearly had some staying power yeah. <laughs> over the millennia. Sometime in the last 10,000 years, they established the Lon Lon Dairy Empire. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's rise and fall almost more meteoric than Demise himself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From a uh, food conglomerate, Neslon Lon. <laughs> <laughs> they got in some trouble when they started selling Divine Beast Vanaburus's water to impoverished communities, but uh, <laughs> they pulled back and rebranded, and now they're just a humble small town farm. <laughs> yeah, so the, the Ocarina of Time ones are fun because they're the most obvious, but you know, like the Arbiter's Grounds, there's kind of not a lot there. Mm. Um, it is cool because it is very clear and you can like see, oh my God, this is the Temple of Time and this is the that and that's the that. But it, it you know, that's kind of where it starts and ends. Um, so it's great to establish the chronology, but these are very obvious and they don't really establish that sense of, of mystery quite as much, mm. um, which is okay. It's good to have a mix of it. And that's, you know, you can't have everything make no sense. Otherwise you have Dark Souls, which is <laughs> famously uh, impregnable lore, but it's it's cool. It's it's a good thing that will, uh, you know, have players recognize that, oh, like this is still the same world and like, oh, these things are still here after all this time, which is cool. It's good to have yeah. those like anchor points in there. Yeah. One other thing from Ocarina of Time is uh, Zelda's lullaby, which has appeared in other games too, but it is still a symbol of the royal family to the point where in the Sanctum throne room area, of Hyrule Castle, the Triforce Aww. emblem above the throne is ringed with these three little musical measures that have mm -hmm. the notes for Zelda's lullaby, like, 
carved and and you know emblazoned in there. Aww. Some of the notes are slightly in the wrong place. Uh, could have been an art mistake. Could have been the melody getting a little bit uh, a little bit smushed uh, after millennia upon millennia. But it is super cool that after all this time. The, you know, the song, the, the theme tune of the Hylian <laughs> royal family is still Zelda's lullaby. Actually, you know what That's I really, cool. what I like about that is that it kind of implies that they've forgotten that it's sheet music. But like, if you make that the symbol of the royal family around the Triforce, and then, you know, you don't think to pass down that, by the way, this is sheet music, and if some blonde kid comes in here with like a musical instrument, point him at it, and he'll figure it out. <laughs> like, you know... If you're drawing a symbol and you don't know what the symbol means, then it's very easy to kind of just maybe like put the dots yeah. in the wrong place. It's like uh, when people were like forging Egyptian artifacts before they knew what hieroglyphs meant. Oh. Like <laughs> it would just be random yeah. little pictograms and like symbols and squiggles. And people were like, oh, it looks very legitimate. And then later it's like, wait a f***ing second. <laughs> That's the entirely yeah. wrong kind of bird and it's facing the wrong way. You know, um, yeah. so I think it makes sense that it would have been like, all right, the dots kind of go like this and there's kind of this pattern, but like, it doesn't really matter which of these rings it goes on, right? And then it's like, oh, but it does actually. Yeah, yeah, it, it makes sense how it could be corrupted over time. One possible counterpoint, um, although it is not strictly speaking canon, is in Hyrule Warriors mm. Age of Calamity, which itself is not a canon game, but a lot of people take the, the lore around it right. as canon and the world building, even if the events are not canon. Um, Tarako, the, the cute little egg guardian guy, Ma. it plays the Zelda's lullaby song. Um, mm. So it is it is implied in that game, not strictly canon, that it is still used as a lullaby, which is really oh, yeah. cool. So, I mean, so either either option is, uh, is an interesting interpretation. I'd say they're not even mutually exclusive. The song can have survived easily, but they might not necessarily recognize that this symbol of the royal uh, family yeah, is... Yeah, they might not have... Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Like, it, they might yeah, have started might as the same thing. Yeah, they might have connected the sheet but, music to the... Right, know, right, yeah. It's like, yeah. oh, we've got the Triforce surrounded by this pretty pattern of, like, lines and dots, you know? Okay, yeah, cool. Makes sense. You kind of put a, a radiant symbol behind a throne. It looks really good, you know, very standard stuff. But then, you know, a couple generations down the line, you forget that the reason why those lines and dots are where they are is because it's a coded representation of your royal theme music. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's a very cool example of of continuity uh, in display mm -hmm. because we see stuff of like, you know, here's a thing that has been dead for a long time and that helps us date what's going on. Here's a thing that's been buried for 10,000 years. But this is really cool because it shows that there are still some, you know, immutable aspects of of the the lore in this world that will somehow find a way to continue going on yeah. or we can be silly and imagine that every time hylia reincarnates as zelda like age of like 13 14 15 she'll just be like <laughs> just like idly and the king's like write that down write that down yeah. <laughs> she, <laughs> she just keeps randomly coming up with the song yeah. every single time she's reincarnated she gets born and she's just like i have the weirdest song stuck in my head what the is that? <laughs> oh, exactly. man. Exactly. Shout out yeah. to Twilight Princess's musical minigame. I like that all the Zelda games have, like, some kind of musical minigame, even if it's not actually oh, yeah. important to the plot. And in Twilight Princess, they have to account for the fact that for about 50% of the game, you don't have opposable thumbs. <laughs> so you just have to wolf howl along with the melody, which is super yeah. cute. <laughs> Link yeah. puts up with so much crap in that game, honestly. <laughs> that man has oh, the patience yeah. of a monk. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and now we, we start to get proper f***ing ancient here. Yes. So, um, jumping back to uh, to way earlier than, than Twilight Princess, than Ocarina of Time, than all of that, the Laneru Promenade in the southeastern part of the map leading up to uh, Mount Laneru has the same architecture as the temples in Skyward Sword, the very first Zelda game, yes. way at the very beginning of the uh, the timeline. It's got the same cubic stonework, it has loft wing patterns, the, this this picture of uh, Laneru Promenade, you can see this, this loft wing shape one of them has their, their face kind of broken off, but mm. it's a, a picture of a loft wing. Those went extinct a very long time ago. Uh, so clearly it is it is a stylistic continuity um, rather than like they just decided to keep sculpting loft wings. Um, that's another thing of like, what does this symbol mean? I don't know, put it on the, put it on the promenade. Mm. Um, and there are also designs uh, around um, Laneru Promenade that have a, a stone... Um, inscription uh, pattern of the goddess's harp, which is a big plot device in that oh, game. Love so, it. Um, really cool stuff that there's this monumental, basically parade way architecture leading from from Hyrule Field over to uh, Mount Laneru, which is the the site of one of the the goddess uh, springs, and they they adorned it with all this cool stuff. So it's implied to have probably been made after Skyward Sword, uh, but okay. not very far after Skyward Sword. It's still kind of in the same realm of time, mm. but it's cool. Yeah, it's I really cool. I was gonna say so like. 
As I recall, in Skyward Sword, like, obviously people remember the Flying Islands gimmick, but there really aren't actually that many Flying Islands. Like, that map is actually tiny. You spend most of your time on the ground. So, like, this yeah. is the architecture of the temples that were already on the ground. So it's not like this would have been some big flying temple complex that fell and became part of the landscape, as cool as that would be. This is probably just, like, either built shortly after it or one of the temples from the original game that was already on the ground, and it just kind of has eroded a little bit. Like, that's the vibe? Uh, uh, holster that thought, oh, actually. Okay, uh, <laughs> all right, I'll put it back in the chamber. Let's do this. <laughs> uh, so next, as as we go up to um to the uh, to Mount Lanayru, we'll encounter one of the the sacred springs in in Breath of the Wild. There are springs to wisdom, uh, courage, and power, oh. and these are you know point for point the exact same as the Skyview Temple Spring and the Earth Temple Spring in Skyward Sword. It's a colonnaded walkway with a small staircase leading up to a little area where there is a small little lake leading up to a statue of the goddess that you pray at for game reasons. Yes. One to one. The Perfect. the springs uh, in Breath of the Wild are the springs in Skyward Sword. They're they're just still there from from the surface. That's cool. I love it. That's super cool. It's got the same architecture, same kind of like loft wing designs and, and patterns and stuff like that. And it's it's just neat. It's just really neat. So that stuff was there before the events uh, of, of Skyward Sword. So uh, Linera Promenade came a little after. <laughs> Springs came a little before, so these things are old. This is advanced ancient. Finally, uh, or almost finally, we get to the Forgotten Temple, the northwest of the map in Tanagar Canyon, where in the game, Link receives the cap and tunic and trousers of the wild upon completing all 120 shrines, earning his spot as the hero of the wild. Yeah. Where he really should have gone to be Ganon by now. Uh, <laughs> poor Zelda has been holding him out uh, for years. Link, <laughs> I don't have effect. that much time, but like, you know, if you need to like doll yourself up a little bit, <laughs> work out a little, you know, keep it, you, I've, I've held this for like a hundred years. I can probably manage a couple more weeks. You know, just have fun. <laughs> Link, that hat is really fly, but I kind of really need your help right now. <laughs> Yeah, so in, in the game lore, uh, it's explained elsewhere uh, outside of the game in, like, companion books, uh, creating a champion, art books and stuff like that, mm -hmm. that the Forgotten Temple was used um, in, in centuries past to honor the legacy of the goddess's chosen hero. So Hylians would journey over to the temple to pay their respects to the heroes who have saved Hyrule from Ganon again and again and again, and it just exists as an in-universe pilgrimage site, which is really cool that there's, like, this kind of thing that... Like, people have caught on to the idea that this is kind of a recurring process, and so they, they, they have a space where they go to to, you know, pay their respects, to try to look out for any kids who, who look about the right shape, uh, height, and build, <laughs> and, and keep records of, of all this, this cool stuff with, with heroes of, of, of the past. So that's really neat, uh, just, just in itself. I'm sorry, my, my brain just latched onto the echolalia of you saying Ganon again and again, because it's like, oh my god, Ganon <laughs> is just in the phrase again and again and again. <laughs> <laughs> it was meant to be! <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> wow, okay. Um, so, this is the Seal Temple from Skyward Sword. <laughs> oh, well then! Well, would you look at that! <laughs> yeah, so it's described in the lore as housing the oldest statue of the goddess, uh, and the first giant statue of Hylia that we encounter appears in Skyward Sword up on Skyloft. Uh, and later in the game, uh, as uh, events uh, unfold, Link sends the temple in the sky uh, with the, the statue of the goddess Hylia crashing down to the surface to imprison the demon king Demise. Nice uh, work, when... Link. <laughs> nice work, Link, yeah. Uh, he basically, he sends the, the this, this giant temple crashing down to the surface. This this statue of Hylia was was up in the clouds on Skyloft, and then, because of, of Link doing plot things, it came down to Earth. Right. So... This is where that statue ends up. It's the oldest statue of Hylia, and here it is uh, in the Forgotten Temple. Oh, I love it. This feels Super like cool. like we're playing Zelda in the Shadow of the Colossus universe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it really does. <laughs> yeah. You get a very clear sense of time with this building because it has clearly been renovated over the years to... Uh, to expand it, to fix broken sections of the wall. There are parts where some some parts of the wall are caved in uh, and, and plastered over with smaller bricks mm. over time. So it was clearly used and reused again and again. It's unclear if people still remember that this was uh, the, the sealed uh, temple from way back when. Um, but uh, it is, uh, and it's super cool. <laughs> yeah. It's the same core architecture. It's, it's obviously been expanded and changed, but it's the same fundamental setup. This building is one of the oldest things in the entire series. <laughs> By the time Skyward Sword happens, 
this building was already thousands of years old. Gorgeous. <laughs> and it was it was built when Hylia was still, you know, incarnate as the goddess Hylia mm -hmm. on on Earth before she you know she gave up her immortal form to to reincarnate as Zelda. So this place is crazy old. It's where Link first uh, picked up the Master Sword, uh, forged it into its final form. Mm. Um, it's it's where Link stepped into the ancient past to go uh, to go fight Demise um, for the final time to to seal him away because he has to beat him. He has to beat him twice again. Plot yeah, things. yeah, yeah. Um, sword stuff. One of the other really cool things is uh, there is a plot point in the game where Link has to go plant the Tree of Life in the ancient past to help the dragon Lanayru, because the dragon is sick. In the present of Skyward Sword, the dragon's dead. So Ooh. Link goes into the ancient past, takes the seed for the Tree of Life, plants it in the sealed temple, comes back to the present, gets the fruit from the Tree of Life after it's spent millennia growing to, to full maturity, mm. takes it back into the ancient past, gives it to the dragon and heals him up. And you can see in the Forgotten Temple in Breath of the Wild, if you look on the left side of the temple, that tree is still there. Oh, man. <laughs> it's insane. It's in the exact same spot where it should be. It looks like it was kind of, like, covered over, but the tree, like, punched through the wall to get yes, out. Yes, good. Insanity. <laughs> Absolute insanity. There's more still time there travel than I remember spot. in Skyward Sword, but... <laughs> there's a lot of there's yeah. a lot of time travel. So the Gate of Time is is actually here uh, in, the, <laughs> in the Seal Temple. It's not, oh. like, here, here right now. Um, it assembles with, like, magic and stuff. Uh, of course, yeah. It was Hylia's temple before it was the sealed temple. It was so old that it is as old as the goddess herself. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> I like the idea that, like, as they're building more of this temple complex around it, but they've kind of forgotten that it was sealed on top of Demise or whatever. They're like, yeah, there's some, like, evil in the basement. We're not really sure where it's coming from. So this this place is 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 truly insanely old. It's it's the oldest building uh, as far as we're aware in the entire Zelda history. It was around when the goddess Hylia walked the lands. This place is crazy old. Yes, old as balls. Uh. Old, old as balls, indeed. <laughs> There is one thing, however, that that might be ever so slightly older than even this, and that is the Breach of Demise, oh. which is the the area so old it is only implied uh, in Skyward Sword's prologue as the place where the Demon King Demise first came to terrorize the world uh, of Hyrule before it was really even Hyrule. He he was said to have have come out from from you know this chasm in the earth spilling out with all of his minions to come do all this this evil stuff. And there is a place in the the world uh, of, of Breath of the Wild Hyrule called the Breach of Demise that really looks like uh, a place that got uh, that got forcibly pushed upwards and, and spread out. There There's this chasm area where this whole jagged array of rocks that, that look like two hands nestling in with each other. They, they kind of lace in these big jagged peaks that got forced open. It's not necessarily a hundred percent the actual breach of actual demise but with a place called that that looks like this it's hard to imagine what else it could possibly be instead of the place where demise did in fact breach yeah i think there are there are two possibilities for that either it is not literally the place where demise breached but that myth is so ingrained in the collective consciousness yeah. that they see this big rift and they call it like Ah, yes, this is where our Satan analog poked his head out. It makes sense. Or it's literally where that happened. <laughs> Either yeah, way, it's exactly. cool. Yeah. There are, you know, some parallels to, to various places in uh, in world mythology where it's like, ah, yes, this this story of whatever the hell it, it happened over there on yeah. that hill. Trust me. Yeah. Yeah, okay, you know, they invent that stuff after the fact. But still, uh, clearly it was chosen for a reason. So it's wild to think that the location of the inciting incident in the entire Legend of Zelda series is still here. Oh, I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> it's absolutely crazy. God, I'm hyped for Breath uh, of the Wild, and, too. And that is, that is all, uh, all I have uh, to say that... Uh, this Hyrule is is so old, it is actually quite genuinely scary. Uh, yeah. uh, because yeah. the game seamlessly blends the history of the immediate past with the history of the terrifyingly much more distant past in a way that allows the user to genuinely conceive of 10,000 years ago as recent compared to the history that goes back tens of thousands of years ago. Yeah, and for context, like real world history 
it, we're getting into fully like we ba we basically don't know anything concrete aside from like oh we reconstructed this and and you know we have scraps of like this and, yeah. and we found a cave that people lived in around then it's like like we didn't domesticate dogs until 15,000 years ago like yeah, that that's like, how old <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Like we cap out at like like 10,000 like max, but like really it's hard to get much further than like 3. Yeah. So, yeah, 10,000 is like oh yeah, like four, stone age, you know, we think we domesticated the goat around then. Yeah, well yeah. something like that and then 3,000 it's like okay, yeah, we we kind of know what's up then. Kind. Yeah. Even then it's like we don't know where this civilization was. We think they existed cuz a lot of their neighbors talked about them, but like where? Yeah. Who the f knows? Yeah. And it's, it's cool that the game does such a good job of creating an internally consistent timeline of events so the player can understand, you know, what happened when, what came before what, and, you know, sure, the, the Sheikah Shrines are, are older than the game by about 10,000 years, but they're not as old as the Temple of Time, which is mm -hmm. not as old as the Forgotten Temple. So even with, you know, strata upon strata upon strata of game history, it's still distinct and it doesn't just settle into a, a mush of the ancient past because it's able to draw on all of that stuff from older games and create an intelligible world lore that is expressed through the game and that's really cool because not a lot of games can do that. There's something very impressive about a game franchise like Zelda of all things taking mm -hmm. a concept that is ultimately designed to be the same game over and over again and yeah. creating a world for it that feels so much bigger than just this same battle happening over and over again, while also yeah. still being shaped so strongly by that battle. Like, yep. I mean, I've seen a few people be like, hey, I wonder what Link and Zelda were up to 10,000 years ago when they had their inevitable incarnations during the first Great Cal Calamity. That would be kind of cool to explore. Like, it, it sure would be. But like, the fact that we don't need to know what they were up to, we can just be like, mm -hmm. yeah, Giant robots happened. Smaller giant robots happened. Uh, somebody <laughs> shot a laser through a mountain. Um, you know, <laughs> just little things. Yeah. Um, and you can imagine, like, the ancient Sheikah are like, okay, guys, I know the legends say that <laughs> this one twink kid and his girlfriend, the princess, are going to save... Hyrule, but do we really want to trust just <laughs> them? We can build robot tanks for this. It's like, look, we can do that. We can wait for the uh, for, for the amazing blonde duo all we want, but I'm just saying we could also build a giant laser robot shaped like an elephant. I'm just saying we yeah. could try my way too, <laughs> you know? And then afterwards it's like, okay, the, the king of Hyrule cut our funding. We got to <laughs> bury the, the giant lizard robot tanks. Let's let's just make a, a, a f***ing jungle gym for the kid instead. He said something about <laughs> upstaging his princess so you know <laughs> yeah so it's it is really cool and, and obviously zelda has has been uh, a franchise uh that from it's it's beginning in in 1986 something you know it's it's been about exploration it's been about mm -hmm. discovery tm mm -hmm. uh and it's it's telling that you know breath of the wild's hyrule has been praised by someone or other basically every day since the game first came out in 2017 yep it is quite impressive that we are still talking about it because that is a lot of time in like video game time where it's always, you know, what's the what's the hottest thing? What have you done recently? And, you know, Breath of the Wild is not the oldest game, that's for sure. Mm. Um, but the fact that we are still having such involved conversations about how this game did what it did so well, it's really impressive. Well, I think one thing that we can kind of key in on that we've essentially been sort of orbiting for this whole conversation is that uh, previous Zelda games were very linear storytelling wise uh, and mm -hmm. part of that was definitely limitations of the medium like yeah. you know older consoles like Moore's Law is a real thing you know computers get mm -hmm. way better every like 18 months and in a lot of games it's like you have an invisible wall because you cannot render the world past this point you know I I'll go to bat for Twilight Princess but that game is a straight line and there are like <laughs> three locations you can go to at any given time and one of them is just a town full of people who yell at you for being a wolf and it's like you kind of have this this ludo narrative dissonance between this is a game where the entire point is to give you that feeling of exploration but we have to put you on this railroad track basically so like you can look out the windows and see all that beautiful stuff out there but ultimately you have to do these things in this order. You know, you, you can't go to this mm -hmm. temple until you get this item that lets you get there. You can't do this stuff until you do that. And I think that what Breath of the Wild did that is why everyone is still talking about it and why it's so different from the previous Zelda games is that it took the vibe of the previous Zelda games and then it made it open world. I mean, that yeah. was the whole selling point, but Zelda was made to be open world, you know? Like 
every preview. The original was. <laughs> it was, yeah. But at the same yeah. time, it's like it's 2D. It's got like four colors on the screen at any given time. You're you're like a a little five pixel man running around, and maybe your hair is pink, and I'm not 100 percent sure on that. And it's like. It had the exploration vibe, but as things got more complicated, they were really pushing the limits of what they could physically, technologically do. And that means you get games that are absolutely gorgeous by the standards of the time, but like they can render one room at a time, basically. Maybe two. Yeah, no, and then with, exactly. with Breath of the Wild, they were like, okay, we've got the equivalent of a supercomputer in every console. We can afford to do this. We're going to go. do it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. they do a lot of very... There, there was a lot of a lot of hullabaloo in the, the interviewing process and in, in the press for the game mm. where uh, where AGI and Numa and, and friends, uh, developers, were basically saying that we we really went back to the start for this. Yes. You know, what made the first Zelda game so good? Okay, let's do that. And it's cool that they not only basically threw off all their previous design choices that let's go back to the very beginning and build everything around that core feeling of discovery. Mm -hmm. You know, Shigeru Miyamoto loved to go, you know, running around in his neighborhood, climbing trees and, and going in caves around uh, his home, his home neighborhood in Tokyo. Right. Put that feeling in a kingdom uh, and there <laughs> you go. But, but at the same time, they're also making such informed and specific and precise use of all of the lore in the games that have come before in order to craft such an intricate and interesting story out of these little a scrap here a piece there mm -hmm. tying it together in ways that if this was a standalone story that existed in a vacuum sure you'd get you know the the first calamity second calamity and you get a sense of history from that but the fact that the zelda you know series is able to pull on so much yeah. world lore and assemble that into one space and have this strata of 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 game history is really really cool and it is a unique asset of of the zelda series that a lot of other episodic yearly release games mm -hmm. um try to build on but don't come anywhere close to accomplishing because they yep. try to exposition dump everything and hammer you over the head with how cool it is uh whereas zelda you know in breath of the wilds they they give you almost no exposition they give you just the barest minimum tools to understand the world and then sets you loose to go be a hylian archaeologist uh -huh. <laughs> it, it shows you the temple of time as soon as you get out of the world so it says hey look for stuff yep you'll find it and then as you go outside the great plateau you you'll see more things and you'll realize like oh wait this is that that's that but they show you right at the beginning like hey this this is a new thing sure we're you know a million years in the future and the world's been destroyed but like the stuff you know as a player is still there uh -huh. that world is still there and that's cool that's really cool design i think they they did a couple things that I think are really good. One, they they sort of did a thing that I know that uh, Dark Souls does, where if there's a big thing off in the distance in the skybox, you can go there and probably yeah. fight like you know something the size of a semi truck there. But like you know you see something cool and it's really there and you can go there. And Breath of the Wild does the same thing. And that's the other thing. Breath of the Wild strikes a really good balance in making the world feel very big and explorable and making you feel like you have the tools to explore it. Like, they do a yeah. couple standard Zelda things where it's like, if you want to go to the underground place or the, the underwater place, you maybe need a special suit so you can swim. If you want to go to the really hot place, you maybe need a special suit so you don't die. Like, that's okay. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Most of the other places you can get to by climbing and, like, falling down cliffs yep. a couple times. And a lot of games with survival mechanics, it's kind of like the game is punishing you for not being able to immediately find food so i like that it's like you can cook you don't have to cook but it's helpful yeah. so it's like and, yeah. and you can climb but you can't climb under all circumstances like if it's raining and you're halfway up a cliff you probably want to find shelter and cook up a nice meal and it's like the game just by the way the gameplay is designed diegetically encourages you to like do real camping stuff you would probably do in that situation which immerses you and that's really good because if the whole point is the feeling of exploration it needs to give you two things it needs to give you the tools to explore and a world you, that you want to explore that you can explore but it's still a challenge so it doesn't just feel like you can essentially beat the game by just running around however you want and, and you know yeah like i mean i love speed running as much as anybody but like you really get the full <laughs> experience of the game by playing by the rules essentially and the fact that it's yeah. hard to break the game really helps encourage that you can't like skyrim clip your horse halfway up the cliff you gotta actually climb <laughs> I, I like that i really like that
Anyway, it's a good game. I'm excited for the second one. Yeah, no, it's 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 a really great game, and the way that they do the lore is is honestly a uh, a, a clinic, uh, a masterclass for anyone else uh, who wants to do this yes. stuff. Yes. Um. So uh, of course there is much more Zelda lore to be discovered. That's so much of the fun of it. So a a huge thanks again to Zeltic, um, for letting us use his footage yes. uh, and letting us build off of his theories. Uh, if you want to learn more of this. All of the things we talked about, you can find in videos I've linked in the description to to his channel. And if you just Google Zelda theories, you'll find a whole bunch of cool stuff. So <laughs> thank you again to Zeltic. And that is all I've got from me. So I don't know, Ren, what what, what do you think about uh, about free ah! time in Breath of the Wild? <laughs> I think that uh, Breath of the Wild successfully does what it set out to do, where it... it clearly wanted to create a world that felt very old and kind of eldritch, but not inhospitable. And I think they managed to pull that off. So you end up getting this sense of familiarity, which is a big help because of, you know, all the familiar landmarks, no matter how much or how little you've played of Zelda, the whole place feels fairly homey, while also yeah. feeling kind of like, not hostile. I mean, you know, there are monsters, but they don't actually feel like they belong in the world. It feels like a, a familiar house, you know, in the dark with a serial killer in it. You know, like you still like the house. It's yeah. just the, it's it's the circumstances that are making it inhospitable, and you kind of want to you're you're compelled to fix that, which is of course a core gameplay mechanic. So it's good that the game design passively encourages yeah. you to do that. If you know a lot of Zelda lore, then it's just a treat. You know, you're running around, you're like, oh, yeah, I was here in exactly. Skyward Sword ten thousand plus years ago, and it it kind of. I think it's one of those things where, in universe, you can sort of see this as like, if you don't know what you're doing, this is Link with full amnesia. And if you have played Zelda games before, this is Link getting weird echoes of all of his past yeah. lives. It's like, that tree yeah. is weirdly familiar. Why do I remember that tree? That statue, I could have sworn it didn't used to have a roof over it. Just like, all that good shit. <gasps> I love it when yeah. the analysis of the game doesn't detract from the game but actually strengthens it and and i think yeah they did so much work in the world building and the visual and and game design of breath of the wild that it just ended up working really well and i am excited for breath of the wild too and i really hope yeah. they can pull it off a second time <laughs> oh i think so that's why they're taking the time yeah uh, but that yeah they they gave you a high rule worth fighting for yeah. in breath of the wild and that's yeah. why it works so well so uh bye <laughs> <laughs>